lift my hands. I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne, for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you this song. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. Come on, church, join us. I lift my hands. I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne. You reign on the throne. For you are God. For you are God and God alone. Because of you my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to I you. I can sing to you this song. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. All right, just the congregation. It's time for praise and worship. Sing. Help them out. You reign on the throne. For you are God. For you are God and God. All lift our voices. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you. I can sing to you this song. I just want. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. One last time, I lift my hands. I lift my hands in total adoration. Reign on the throne. For you are God. For you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you. I can sing to you this song. I just want. I just want to say that I love you more than.
bow down and worship him. Holy, holy, holy 
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray someone will come to show the storm, the smallest prayer will still be heard. I believe that someone in that great somewhere hears every word. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a leaf, or see the sky, then I know I, I believe. I believe above the storm, the smallest prayer will still be heard. believe that someone in that great somewhere hears every word. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a leaf or see the sky, then I know A newborn baby cry or touch a leaf or see the sky that I know. Father, as we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness, fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power, speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, let the church say... Amen and amen. Somebody say amen today. What an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. Now I need your prayers today. I said I need your prayers today. 
Somebody praying for me? If you have your Bibles, we're going to be tackling one of the most difficult subjects today, but I know God is going to be with us. Amen? If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 13. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Thank you, Jesus. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Come with me to a day when our Lord Jesus had taken his disciples to Philippi. And as they walked together, they saw shrines and temples raised up in honor of many false gods and deities. In the midst of this pervasive widespread idolatry, Jesus asked his disciples a probing unnerving question, a question I believe that is fundamental to our faith. Jesus looked at his disciples and said to them, who do people really think I am? In the tradition of responsive scholarly rabbis, the disciples answered saying, some people think you're John the Baptist come back to life. Others think you're Elijah returned from heaven. Some think you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But who do you say I am, said Jesus. Then Peter spoke up, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. What you have spoken came as a direct revelation from your Father in heaven. And it is upon the rock of this revelation I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My message this morning is entitled, What is Happening to My Church? What is happening to my church? Now, here in our scripture, the first time the word church is used in all the Bible, it is first used by Jesus. 
And the word translated church, no one really knows where it came from. The best scholars tell us that it is the German pronunciation of the Greek word ecclesia, meaning called out. <laughs> this is shocking to some of you. Jesus never used the word church as we use it. You see, while on earth, Jesus spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. He didn't even speak Greek. Even on the cross, you know, the Bible says when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the Bible says, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those words on the cross spoken by Jesus were spoken, Eloi, Eloi, that's lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic. Now, the Aramaic word Jesus used for church when he said, upon this rock I build my church, is the word ladoth. Are you all with me today? And that word ladoth means to assemble or gather together for the purpose of testifying and instructing. So according to the vision of Jesus, as one writer said, the church is a gathering or an assembling together of believers to learn about God, about what he expects from us, and what he expects us to do. According to the vision of Jesus, the church is also a place where we can testify and bear witness about what God has done and is doing in our lives. Now, friends, that word church has come to mean many more things to us than Jesus first intended. When we say, I want you to come to my church, we usually mean a building called a church. Or when we say, I will see you at my church, we are referring to a church that we belong to and not a church that belongs to us. <laughs> Did you miss that? Can I say that one more time? When he said, come to my church, we're referring to a church that we belong to, but it's not my in the sense that it belongs to us. Jesus is the only one with the authority to say, my church. Meaning a church that is mine. And I believe Jesus was intentional with his language, took great pains to be precise. So no one could ever be mistaken that when he said, upon this rock I will build my church, that he did not say, I will build your church or I will build our church. Jesus said, I will build my church. My church means is his church, not ours. I know some people act like they own the church. But it's not your church. It's his church. And still, this clear declaration by Jesus has not stopped some denominations from declaring themselves the only true church. Church, the only true church is his church. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth his true church. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And throughout history, many have commandeered and hijacked that word church for power, for political purposes. 
They have invested it with meaning that often obscures and detracts from that early declaration of Jesus. At the very beginning of the gospel dispensation, the servant of God says, he taught his church to rely not on worldly rank and splendor, but on the power of faith and obedience. The favor of God is of great, greater value than gold, silver. The power of his spirit is of inestimable worth. But often today, when we talk about the church, we are referring to a corporate institution, a Delaware LLC. Church! Corporations were established to manage money, power, and control. Their primary goals are survival, sustainability, and profit. And they are all worthy goals. But to be clear, these corporations and institutions are meant to assist the church. They are not the church. Did you hear me today? His church, don't be confused, his church is bigger than any corporation. His church is bigger than any Delaware LLC. His church is bigger than any one denomination. Even yours. Even ours. His church is bigger than our ecclesiastical polity. His church is bigger than our operational structures of governance. Don't be confused. No Delaware or Michigan corporation is big enough to hold his church. These organizations and institutions were raised up to serve his church. His church is bigger than your headquarters. His church is bigger than your impressive buildings. His church is bigger than your logo. His church is bigger than your missional infrastructures. And you know what that means. It means that the work of his church is bigger than everything you're doing. Oh, come on, are you with me today? It means that the work of his church is bigger than all the work your denomination is doing, supervising, or directing. His church here on earth is both visible and invisible. His invisible church here on earth does not have an address. His invisible church here on earth does not have a bank account does not have a headquarters, has no EIN numbers, no formation documents, no ownership agreements, because he's the one who owns. Listen to what the servant of God says. There are true Christians in every church. She said, God accepts their sincerity Woo! but when light shall fall upon their pathway God requires them to come into harmony with his law and I love how the servant of the Lord defines the church she said the church is a Christian society formed for the members composing it that each member may enjoy the assistance of all the graces and talents of the other members. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And the working of God upon them according to their several, what? Gifts and abilities. Now, allow me to give you my definition of the church. 
The church of Jesus, and notice I said the church of Jesus, is a body of believers who assemble for society and community in obedience to the will and command of God. Sometimes they meet in a building you can see a name, and sometimes they meet in secret under starry skies. The church is God's faithful, chosen people who live you knew that would come somewhere, huh? Eh? <laughs> to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of Christ in the earth and all members of his true church will be Christ-like. Brothers and sisters, sadly, sadly, we have transformed the primary vision of his church. We've turned the church into an institution that has administration and bureaucracy. And yes, we know and believe, we know and believe that order and organization are essential to carrying out the methods and strategies of the church. But something has gone wrong. Something's gone wrong with the church. All around this country, I hear people crying, what is happening to my church? I go to church, I look around, and I say, where's everybody? Huh? What's happening to my church? It's not like it was in the good old days. Members are not dedicated like they used to be. People are not committed like they once were. All around the country, the leading indicators of the health of the Christian church have been going the wrong way. And you know your pastor for decades. I've been one of the voices crying in the wilderness. The patient is sick. The patient needs help. The church in all its dimensions, all its denominational expressions is in trouble. Did you know that almost a hundred Christian churches close their doors for good every day in America? Did you know from the year 2000 to 2020, the amount of Christians in America who now say they are practicing Christians, it dropped from 45% to 25%. And in North America, we as Adventists, we're not able to grow the church by even one member per church per year. What's happening to the church? Our churches are aging. <laughs> We got more members hobbling than ever before. Barely walking in through the door. Our churches are empty. We're blessed here at Palm Bay. You didn't hear what I just said. We're blessed. Did you know that the median attendance for our church is 53 people? The average is, come on, are you with me today? We're losing our young adults. People everywhere are crying, what is happening to my church? Three days ago, a pastor friend of mine told me that the pastors in his conference were informed at their workers' meeting by conference administrators that just like the church, in the manual has a process of going from a small group to a company to a church because of so many of our churches are declining and shrinking. Our conferences now want to put in the manual a process to go from the church back to the company, back to the group. We're going the wrong way. We should be adding churches, not closing them. No wonder people say, what's happening to my church? It was Jesus who told us what would be happening to his church in the last days. 
Revelation 3, 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched that's the church wretched miserable poor blind naked the Lord warned us that in the last days, his church would be financially wealthy, but spiritually impoverished. And that's right where we are. Did you know we're a rich church? I said, did you know that your church is a rich church? I know, I know of one union, one, one, one union that has an evangelism endowment fund of over $1.5 billion sitting in an account. But their charter also states that they are not allowed to use any of that $1.5 billion on evangelism. It's in an evangelism endowment fund but they're not allowed to use any of it for evangelism. They can only use the interest they make from investing the money to fund evangelistic projects. So that means that should Jesus return today, he would return to a church that has billions in the bank while millions of people are perishing all around us who have never heard the gospel. That's what Jesus was saying in Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich. Yeah, you're rich. And increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not, Lord said, what you really don't know is that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you how the Lord told it to me. Jesus is soon to come and we have banked the principle of the third angel's message and we are living off the interest. And we are propping up a failed institutional system with platitudes and our children and grandchildren, should the Lord tarry, will receive from us a shell of what we used to call a church. What's happening to my church? We've come to a point where images and video are a more powerful communication tool to the modern mind and paper and the printed page. You can't even find Bibles in the church. That means the churches of the future will look very different than the churches of the past. What's happening to the past? What's happening to my church? Your church is changing. And I'm not sure who hates change more, the members or the leaders. But this I know. If we persist in holding too tightly to the greatness of the church of the past, we will miss the greatness of what God wants to do and through his church of the future. You know, Bill Gates, he's a billionaire today because he figured out that every computer needs an operating system. And as the tasks become more complex, you have to upgrade the operating system. So we went from DOS to Windows. The operating system, one writer said, for our church institutions is not DOS, 
but boss. BOSS is an acronym for the bureaucratic operating system. And our bureaucratic operating system has left our institutions bloated, inefficient. They're not delivering results. Our bureaucratic organizations must adapt or they will atrophy and die. Now, hear what I'm saying to you. His church won't die. But the bureaucracy that calls itself a church might die. Our methods must change or our results will continue to shrink and diminish. The leadership styles we are using to run our churches, boss, <laughs> boss and organizations boss they are outmoded outdated obsolete and I believe when the servant of the Lord says she says this God will guide his messengers in the adoption of new methods to arrest the attention of men and convince their judgment he will give skill and understanding in the use of a effective illustrations to arrest the attention of the people. I believe when she says new methods must be introduced, God's people must awaken to the necessity of the time in which they are living. She says they will seek for new methods and ways by which to develop character and educate the youth how to use their talents that have been given to them by God. So even though the picture looks gloomy for your church, I said it looks gloomy. I want you to be sure. As a matter of fact, be sure that you are sure that Jesus said, I said my Jesus said, all the powers of hell will not conquer his church. All the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Look at what the servant of the Lord says. I love this. In Abraham's day, the providence of God was ever open, ever to open up new methods, and progress will be made from generation to generation in order to preserve in the world a knowledge of the true God, of his laws and his commandments in our day. Somebody say hallelujah. So if you are one of those who is asking the question, what is happening to my church? I can tell you what's happening to your local church. Can I tell you what's happening to your local church? I said, can I tell you? The devil is church hunting. And your local church is in his bullseye. And while you've been trying to grow your church, the devil's been trying to shrink your church, divide your church, discourage your church. He's doing everything in his power to diminish your church, its influence and impact. And his goal is always to start some mess in your church and start moving it in the wrong direction. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. Do you think the devil just comes to your church and sing hymns with you? He comes to church to start mess. Oh, did you know the devil uses bait from within the church to catch the people in the church? Bait! What you talking about, pastor? Well, well, his most successful bait is gossip. Gossip is the worm the devil uses to catch most of the members in the church. Gossip is the bait. And there's a hook on the end of that bait. 
And when it gets in your mouth, it'll disfigure your spirit. The servant of God says, watch those people who go from house to house engaged in gossip. And what is that? Dwelling on the faults, wrongs, and inconsistencies of their fellow church members and neighbors. She says gossipers and news carriers are a terrible curse to the church. Check this out. If you don't believe what I'm saying, you know what the servant of God says? She says two-thirds of all the trouble and trials in the church come from gossip. So don't let people come to your house with gossip. Shut it down. As soon as they start going in that direction, shut it down. I believe God has a work for his church to do in these last days and he will show us what to do and how to do it. I don't know what will happen to your church. Those of you who are listening online, some of you online because you don't want to go to your church. You don't like going to your church anymore. I don't know what will happen to your church, but I do know what will happen to his church. Woo! Come on, are you with me today? Revelation 7 verse 9. Let me show you. Can I show you what will happen to his church? He said, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all, come on, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation, read it church. To our God, read it, church, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever. And ever, amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, Who are these people? Who are these which are arrayed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said unto him, Thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they. That's my church, which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb and therefore they before the throne of God serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall what feed them and shall what Lead them unto what? Living fountains of waters and God. You know what the servant of God says? She says, if the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing from all allegiance with the world, there is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. God's promise to her will stand fast forever. Praise the Lord. You don't know how much Jesus loves his church. Pastor, where does the Bible tell us? Well, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ Loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus loves his church and he loves and he wants, he wants you and me to love the church. Can I give you an important quote God gave me about his church? The Lord told me the church is to be challenged 
never denounced and never condemned. Did you hear me today? The church is to be challenged, never denounced, and never condemned. So that means that anybody, because you have some people come and sit in the church, and then they come whispering to people, uh, come, 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 come worship with me. Anybody that tells you leave the church and come have church with me, that's not of God. I said, that's not of God. Look at what the servant God says. She says, we fully believe in church organization as we near the final crisis. Instead of feeling that there is less need of order and harmony of action, we should be more systematic than heretofore. The believer in Christ should understand that dissension and division in the church are brought about through the working of the powers of darkness in order that those who profess to be children of God may not present the oneness for which Christ prayed. Unity. He prayed for unity. So anybody telling you, we don't have to go there. Come, come. I'll have macaroni and cheese after. As we approach the last days, we need more unity in the church, not less. Somebody say amen. amen. So anybody's telling you, come, 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 come. You tell them, in the last days, we need more unity, not less. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. As God unites his children, Satan and his evil angels are very busy to prevent this unity and to destroy it. And the Christ we love, ah, hallelujah, I love the Christ we love, recognize no distinction of nationality or rank or creed in his church. He despises people who divide his church by nationalities and flags. I'm trying my best, Lord Jesus. Don't let me go down too far down this rabbit hole. Well, put it back up. The Christ we love recognize no distinction of nationality or rank. But those who would build up national separation would do a work for which the Lord Jesus Christ has given no encouragement. Church, I believe as we in God's church remain united, God's going to do great things through his church. Now, my, before I close, believe you, with the advent of YouTube and social media, you're going to see can I teach before I leave you today? You're going to see an explosion of every Tom, Dick, and Harry calling themselves preachers and pastors. Ain't never been to school. Come on, are you with me today? But they are finding a way to make money off of any rebellious itch that lives in your heart. Oh, hallelujah, God. Some people got a rebellious itch and those people that you see on YouTube are calling me, come on, let's start. They are praying, I'm not P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, praying on your rebellious itch and they're praying off of the hearts of people who don't want to be accountable to anybody? Who you think those people on YouTube are accountable to? No, 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 no. I'm a pastor of this church because I have chosen the path of service and accountability to this church and this conference. <laughs> 
the ministerial credentials I carry, I have to live and preach so that I am worthy of them. And I believe no matter how famous or how well known you are, somebody has to hold you accountable or you will self-destruct and lead people astray. Did you know that in the church of Jesus, there is a compact, there is a pledge that binds members of the church together. And here's what it is. The servant of God says, she says, the covenant of agreement in church membership is that we as members, come on, put it back up. We as members, each member should do what? Walk. Don't call yourself a member. If you're not committed to walking in the footsteps of Christ, taking his yoke upon you, learning of him who is meek and lowly of heart. So that means membership without friendship with Jesus will only spell hardship. Membership without friendship with Jesus will only spell hardship. Membership without fellowship with Jesus. Membership without a relationship with Jesus. Membership without companionship with Jesus. Membership without a discipleship by Jesus is the definition of a dying church. So everybody who's asking, what's happening to my church? I can tell you what's happening to his church. Before I leave you, I have to tell you why I'm not afraid of what the devil will do to his church. Did you hear me today? I am not afraid of what the devil thinks he will do to his church. The church of Jesus is still the most powerful body God has placed on the earth for the advancement of his kingdom. And despite all the devil's attacks from without and from within, the church is an everlasting fortress which all the powers of hell cannot destroy. She's been able to stand strong under withering pressures, weathering the malice of her enemies and the treachery of her friends. The church of Jesus. It has troubled empires, outlived every adversary that dared rail against her. The church of Jesus has borne the withering winds of persecution, endured hatred and cruelty, and all forms of genocidal opposition. The church of Jesus, every predictor of her downfall, has withered into dust. She is the bride of Christ. She is the Lamb's wife. She is God's spiritual Israel. She is the household of faith. She is the planting of the Lord, his vineyard, the branch of the true vine. She is the salt of the earth. She is the light of the world. We are her called out soldiers, ransomed of the Lord. We are the fellowship of the redeemed. She is the society of baptized believers, justified, sanctified, a brotherhood of saints and sisterhood. The church of Jesus is a divine idea sent out into the earth to reconcile man to the savior of the world. Praise the Lord of heaven. And I gotta tell you as the pianist goes to the piano. In these last days, atheists will condemn the church. Agnostics will denounce her. Scoffers will decry her. The ungodly will scorn and ridicule her. Clowns will parody her. Fools will make fun of her. But I want you to know what Jesus said. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against her. 
and until time until time falls exhausted at the feet of eternity. The church, can I tell you, rain or shine, you're going to find me in a church. I was converted in a church. I was baptized. Somebody help me today. I dedicated my life to the church. I was married in a church. And I married a church girl. I raised my children in the church. And I don't know about you, but when I die, don't just drop me in the ground. Take me from the church. To my final resting place. I want you to sing the hymns of the church and the spirituals of the church. I want the glory of God to be manifested in the church. I want to know, I want the world to know that Jesus said, I am the rock upon which the church is built. And I want you to know I want to stand on that rock till the heavens fall. What's happening to my church? I know what's happening to his church. It will triumph. Somebody say hallelujah. It will triumph. It will triumph. Let's pray. Hallelujah and glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I said, Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I can see you talking to your disciples. I can see you. I can see them saying to you, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I can hear you saying to them and to us that your church is built upon a rock. Upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And one day, one day, all who are part of his church will be standing clothed in garments of righteousness the white robes of righteousness and they will be standing on the sea of glass and if you want to be in that number if you want to be part of that church that is triumphant on the sea of glass I invite you to stand on your feet stand on your feet and let's sing that hymn on Christ the solid rock I stand somebody say all other ground Is singing sand. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. Hallelujah. And I trust the sweetest frame, but holy in Jesus' name. On Christ.
Father, thank you so much for the blessing of today. Thank you for the assurance that your church will stand. Your church will be triumphant. We stand today believing by faith that we will be in that number. That we will be part of your church. And Father, when you come to claim your own, when you come to take your bride, your church, back to the wedding supper of the Lamb, may everyone under the sound of my voice be in that number, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Oh, God, from whom all blessings flow, our faith looks up to thee, God. May we bow our heads for prayer. Thou Lamb of Calvary, Father God, we are so dependent on you right now. Show us what to do and how to do it as we labor in your vineyard. Father, we are holding on to you. We need for you to be our rock so that we can stand faithfully with you even until the end. We wait, Lord, for you to anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this message. We pray with all our hearts, Lord, that you'd look deep into our hearts. Cleanse us, Father, and help us to prepare ourselves and others for your soon return. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Speak
his holy name Like a shepherd Jesus will guard his children In his arms He carries them all day long Praise him, praise him Tell of his excellent greatness Praise him, praise him Ever in joyful song Praise him, praise him Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins, He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, hail Him, hail Him, Jesus, the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus, who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Our blessed Redeemer, heavenly waters, thou with hosannas ring. 